Hello everyone, hope you guys are doing well. So, um, exams are really close now and I hope you guys are studying with 100% concentration. And I also hope that you guys are done with the syllabus. If you are, that's great news. If you're not, I hope you're on the verge of completion. So yeah, uh, what we're gonna do in today's video is that I've decided to start solving yearly uh, past repairs of ad math. So this is something I haven't done. I do have math papers on my channel, but ad math is something I haven't done yet. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. And I've decided that I'm gonna start from the latest. So this is October, November, 2021, paper one, variant two. And I should mention that I will be solving uh, variant two initially, and then once we're done, and then if time allows, inshallah, then I'll also do the other variants, okay? So let's get straight to it. So here we have question number one. Let's see what it says. It says the diagram shows the graph of the cubic function y equals to f of x. The intercepts of the curve with the axes are all integers. Okay, that's great. Find the set of values of x for which f of x is less than zero. Okay, so a little bit about this topic. This is basically cubic um, functions. Okay, you could say cubic functions, polynomials, and then um, under it also falls cubic inequalities. Okay. So how exactly do you do this? Well, it's not any different from quadratic inequalities, uh, given that you have the sketch of the curve, well, once you have the sketch of the curve. So it says, find the set of values of x for which f of x is less than zero. Now I should mention over here that when f of x is less than zero, this means that you're talking about the part of the curve that is below the x-axis. So below the x-axis. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the part and why why below the x-axis? Because it's less than zero, it's negative. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna find the part of the curve that is below the x-axis. And I'm gonna highlight it. So here is one, okay? This is one part of the curve that's below the x-axis. And let's see the range of x um, under which this part of the curve falls. So this part, as you can see right here, starts at minus three and goes all the way to one. So that means, x is greater than minus three, less than one. So this means for as long as x is greater than minus three and less than one, the curve will be below the x-axis. Therefore, f of x will be less than zero. Okay, that was, uh, that was one part, one bit of the curve that's below the x-axis. The next is this part. Now, this part of the curve is from x equals to five and rightward. So what we say over here is that since it's towards the right side of five, so we say or, x is greater than five. So together, this is our answer that x is greater than minus three and less than one, and x is greater than five. And that is the correct answer. Okay. Then it says find an expression for f of x. Okay, so yeah, this also, this type of question also is very common now. So I'm gonna give you a bit of a background as we go along. So yeah, let's get straight to it. So it's, so this is a cubic curve, okay? So cubic curve will uh, maximum have a total of three x intercepts. And we can see one is minus three, one is one, and the other is five. So that means that one thing that I can say for sure now is that its equation is going to be something like this, x plus three, because x equals to minus three, so x equals uh, x plus three, and then x minus one, and then x minus five. Okay, I should mention over here that x equals to minus three, x equals to one, x equals to five, okay? So once you shift uh, these numbers to the left-hand side, this is what you get one by one, okay? But if you just stop here, then you'll get it wrong, okay? And this is a common error. A lot of students think that it's just the x-intercepts that we're concerned with. That's not the case, okay? If you stop here, I don't think you're gonna get all the marks that are. So what you need to do is you need to work out the coefficient of x cubed. Now the question is, how do we do that? How do we work out the coefficient of x cubed? Well, for that, we need a special point through which the curve is passing, and that point, is the y-intercept. So what we do is, so here's, uh, we don't know what the coefficient of x cube is, so we'll call it a. Obviously we have to uh, give it something, right? I mean, we have to call it something, so we'll call it a. Now, in order to find the value of a, we need a point through which the curve is passing, which is other than the x-intercept, because if you plug in x, uh, if you plug in any of these x-intercepts, so y is gonna be zero, and you really won't end up with any value of a. So that point, the question has been kind enough to give to us, and that is the y-intercept, and that is minus five. So that means this point is basically zero minus five. So in place of y, we'll have minus five. In place of x, we'll have zero. Zero plus three is three, zero minus one is minus one, and zero minus five is minus five. So what are we looking at? We are looking at some minus five and minus five. I should just cancel this out altogether. And one is equals to minus three a. I should mention that it's um, 
what we have on the left hand side is not zero it is one okay so uh, a lot of students think that since you've cancelled out it's zero that's not the case okay so that means a is equals to minus one upon three and now that you have the value of a so y is equals to minus one upon three x plus three times x minus one times x minus five and there you go that's your final answer okay that was question number one done and dusted Question number two. Question number two says, given that cube root of xy times zy whole squared over xz, the whole thing to the power minus three upon square root of z is equals to x bar a, y bar b, z bar z. Okay, so this is from indices and this is a fairly simple question. Okay, but you got to be very careful. Okay, um, you got to make sure that you don't mess up with any of the calculations and you got to be as elaborate as possible. Okay, so I'm going to do this. Okay, and we're going to do this with a lot of patience. So xy, you're taking the cube root, so that means the power on x is one upon three, and so is the power on y, one upon three. The power on z is squared, and so is the power on y. In the denominator, we have x with power minus one upon, sorry, not uh, minus one upon three, just minus three, and z also with power minus three. And then you have another z, or z, whatever you wanna call it, with a square root, that means the power here is half, okay? All right, what do we do now? Well. Now, when same bases are multiplied, what happens? The powers are added. And when same bases are divided, the powers are subtracted. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, so let's try and color code this. So we have X here in green and they are being divided. So that means X to the power, oops, sorry about that. X to the power one upon three minus minus three. Okay, so let's work this out. One divided by three minus minus three. So we're looking at 10 upon three. Okay, so you know what? We'll do that in the next step, okay? Yeah. And then let's talk about y. So for which I need to select another color, I'm gonna go with um, blue. So we have y squared and y to the power one upon three. So y is gonna be equal to one upon three plus two. Okay, so that's that. And the thing with z is that you have it uh, multiple times. Okay, so you have z squared in the numerator and you have z power minus three and z power half in the denominator. Now you could first simplify the denominator and then do the numerator and the denominator, but let's just do it directly. Okay, so that means we have z to the power of two minus uh, minus three plus one upon two. Okay, so now it's just a matter of simplifying for which I'm gonna switch to a neutral color and x to the power 10 upon three is what we get once we do one upon three plus three. And then you have one divided by three plus two. So that's y to the power of seven upon three, which is spot on. And then z to the power so two minus, make sure that you write the brackets nicely, minus three plus one over two. So you are looking at c to the power of nine upon two. And there you go. That's your final answer. And that's also the correct answer. Now you could write this um, as as an improper fraction, uh, but I wouldn't recommend that. I mean, why, why waste time doing that? You know, let's just leave it right there. Okay, then it says solve the equation. Okay, so first let's study this equation. You have five times two, P plus one minus 17 times two P plus three equals to zero. Okay, so what's what's really stopping us from being able to solve this question is basically this two to the power P. So we have an equation which is, which is sort of an exponential equation, but what can I do so that it doesn't remain an exponential equation over here? And if you notice that you have two to the power of P, common okay now, now you may argue that you have two to the power 2p over here in fact not just 2p 2 to the power 2p plus 1 and 2 to the power p over here and you're right but what both of them have in common is 2 to the power of p so with questions like these what we will do is we will use the method called substitution and this is something i always tell my students that always always be open to the idea of substitution whether it's um solving questions like these or whether it's logs you will have to use substitution at some point okay so since two to the power p is basically the problem child here, okay, that's what is something I need to replace it with. So I'm gonna say let two to the power p is equals to a. And make sure that you mention it so that the examiner knows exactly what you're referring to when you say two to the power p. Okay, now how can I see, or how can I separate two to the power p from two to the power two p plus one? So what I need to do is, this is two to the power p squared times, okay, in fact, you know what, that would be skipping a step, let's be good students, so 2 to the power 2p times 2 to the power 1 minus 17 
a plus 3 equals to 0. Now I'll tell you what I've done here is I've replaced to the power p here with a and this I've just sort of reverse engineered the whole thing. Okay, we multi we add the powers when you have same basis. So since the powers were being added here, I uh, sort of broke it down. That means now we're looking at 5, 2p squared. Now I can interchange the powers because multiplication in multiplication order doesn't matter whether I do 2 times p or p times 2. It's the same thing. Okay, minus 17a as it is plus 3 equals to 0. So now what we're looking at is, oh, the one thing I forgot to write was, um, is in fact, um, the times two here. Okay, now, so two to the power p, we've taken it to be equal to a, so that means we're looking at five times a square times two minus 17a plus three equals to zero. So now we're looking at 10a square minus 17a plus three equals to zero. Now I'm gonna solve this equation, so factors of uh, 30 that give you 17 so 5 times 6 not gonna work 2 times 15 okay so I'm gonna use my calculator you know let's just be lazy over here and use your cal user calculators to work this out so this is a second degree polynomial 10 minus 17 and 3 or a b and c so we're looking at a is equal to 3 upon 2 or a is equals to 1 upon 5 now at this point please do not get carried away and think this is the end of the question because it's not the end of the question. You've just worked out the value of A, you still need to work out the value of P, which you were asked to initially because the equation had P as the unknown. So that means it's P that you had to work out. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna do that by saying get two to the power P is equals to three upon two or two to the power P is equals to one upon five. Now this takes us to where? This takes us to using logs. Why? Because you can't write three upon two as a power of two and same thing applies to one over five also. So LG two to the power P is equals to LG three upon two. And here we do LG two to the power P is equals to LG one upon five. So P is equals to LG. In fact, again, let's not skip a step. P gets multiplied by LG two. So PLG two is equals to LG three upon two. So P is equals to LG three upon two divided by LG two, or P is equals to LG one upon five divided by LG two. Okay. So again, here I've sort of skipped a step, but you know, I'm sure you guys understand. So we have LG. So log with base 10 is LG, okay. Or you can, you can even use LN if you want, okay. It doesn't make a difference. So LG three upon two divided by, whoops, not minus, divided by LG two. So we're looking at 0 0.585 as one value of P, 0 0.585, which is correct. And the other value of P turns out to be LN one divided by, sorry, log one divided by five divided by log two minus 2.32, minus 2.32, we'll just lock it at minus 2.32, correct to three significant figures. And that also is the correct answer. So yeah. Okay, now we are at question number three, which says write three plus two LGA minus four LGB as a single logarithm to base 10. Okay, so single logarithm to base 10 means that everything should be written as LG. Now, as far as two LGA and minus four LGP are, are concerned, they are already written as LG, so we don't really need to worry about that. This bad boy here, three, this is something I need to change and write it as LG. So what can we do about that? Well, we'll see that, we'll see about that later, but what we should do on an immediate basis is get rid of this two here and bring it on top of a so that it becomes the power and let's do the same with four so that we're looking at lg b to the power four so that it's easy for us to use product or quotient rule whatever it is that we have to use okay now three now what can i do with three so that it remains three and i also have lg there so all i gotta do is just write it as three lg 10 plus lg a squared minus lg b to the power 4. So this becomes LG 10 cube, which is what well, we'll write it in the next step. Okay, plus LG a squared minus LG b to the power 4. So LG 10 cube means LG 1000 plus LG a squared minus LG b to the power 4. So this becomes LG 1000 into a squared upon b to the power 4. And what we've done here is we've done exactly what the question wanted us to do. We've written all of this as a single logarithm, uh, single logarithm using a uh, single logarithm to base 10. Yeah, b to the power 4. There you go. And that fellas is the correct answer. Okay. So, so far, so good. Now it says solve the equation three log four base a plus two log a base four equals to seven. Okay, now remember what I said um, when we were doing question number two, I said be open to the idea of substitution and that is exactly what I would prefer, okay, 
prefer to do over here. Why is that? Because they'll just make the whole, they'll, they'll just make it solving, the solving part a whole lot easier, okay? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take either log four base A or log A base four, doesn't matter, and substitute it as something else, okay? So I will say let log four base A is equal to, um, let's call it P. In fact, no, wait, we already used P. Was it in this question? No, that was another question. Okay, so let's call it P, no big deal. So now we're looking at this, we can easily replace with P because it's the way it is. I mean, it's log four base A and two log A base four can be written as, so what am I gonna use over here? I'm gonna use reciprocal law, okay? So this, if I take the reciprocal of it, so that means I'm looking at log four base A is equals to seven. So what am I looking at now? I'm looking at three P plus two upon P is equals to seven. So where are we headed? We are headed towards a quadratic equation. Well, if you didn't figure that out, that's okay. No, nothing to worry about. So the LCM is P. So three P squared plus two is equals to seven. Now let's cross multiply. So we're looking at three P squared plus two is equals to seven P. Let's shift everything over to the left hand side. So we're looking at three P squared minus seven P plus two equals to zero. Let's solve this using our calculator. So this is a polynomial, second degree, three minus seven, two. Okay, so P is equals to two or P is equals to one upon three. Okay, so now that you have the value of P, do not get carried away and think it's the end of the question because it is not. We initially had to solve for the value of A. So now we go back to our substitution and we say log four base A. We took this to be equal to P, right? So now we know that P is equals to two. So this way A square is equals to four. And then we say A is equals to plus minus two, but we know very well that uh, the base of log cannot be negative, so therefore we abandon the minus sign and just stick to the plus sign, okay? Or we said log four base A is equals to one upon three, and this way we say A to the power one upon three is equals to four, and in order to find the value of A, we need gotta make sure that the power on A is one, for which we need to get rid of one upon three, for which we need to cube both sides. So A is equals to four cubed, which is equal to 64. And there you go. These are your final answers, two and 64. So yeah, so far, so good. Okay, so here's another question where it says solve the equation cot 2x plus pi upon three minus root three equals to zero, where x is from minus pi to pi radians and give your answer in terms of pi. So these questions are basically the ones where you have to alter the range, okay? Now, the first question is, why exactly do we need to alter the range? Well, if you look over here, we have the range of x, okay? So that means the angle here is x. But if you look at the trigonometric function, the angle over here with cot is two x plus pi upon three. So that means, well, there's there's a bit of contradiction over here, okay? Uh, the question has given us the range of x, the range of x and the angle with cot is two x plus pi upon three. So we gotta bring some uniformity over here, okay? And how do we do that? Well, we first of all multiply all three sides by two, okay? So that x becomes two x, pi will become two pi, okay? and minus pi will become minus two pi. Now, since we don't have to just bring it equal to two x, we also have to bring it equal to two x plus pi upon three. So we do pi upon three on all three sides. So that way, what are we looking at? So this becomes two x plus pi upon three, okay? Now two pi plus pi upon three, now in my calculator, I'm just gonna do two plus one upon three and then write a pi towards it in the, uh, and then a pi uh, at the end, so seven upon three pi. And then over here, I'll do minus two plus one upon three. So I am looking at minus five upon three pi. Okay, there you go. Now, now that we have a new range, so I'm just gonna erase this because it's gonna take up, take some space, okay? So yeah. What we're going to do now is we're gonna solve it like a regular equation, okay? So we will say fine, cot two x plus pi upon three, we'll shift root three over to the other side so that, so that it becomes positive. Cot, as we should know, is one upon tan. So one upon tan of two x plus pi upon three is equals to under root three. And then if you cross multiply, so now we're looking at tan two x plus pi upon three is equals to one upon under root three. Okay, so now this looks like a solvable equation. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna find alpha. Okay, so for alpha, this is going to be tan, in fact, before that, I don't know if I mentioned this, but you should convert your calculator to radian mode, okay? So tan of one divided by under root three 
okay uh tan inverse of one upon under root three so we're looking at pi upon six so one upon six pi okay now what we need to do from now on is we need to first decide what quadrants we're dealing with okay and then i'll tell you guys what we're going to do considering that we can go a little bit um, on the negative side also okay so this is zero this is pi upon two this is pi and this is three upon two pi and this is two pi but the thing is the thing is that we can go in the negative direction also so that means instead of going the whole anti-clockwise circle starting from zero i'm going to write down a few values that uh, take me uh, to the negative side so that means if i'm going in a clockwise direction this will be minus pi upon two and this instead of pi will be minus pi so i should mention over here that the angle theta or x is positive if you're going in an anti-clockwise direction and if it's, it's negative if you're going in a clockwise direction okay now we have alpha and we can see that tan is positive so that means we are talking about the first and the third quadrant okay so the first and the third quadrant is what we're talking about over here okay so this becomes pi upon six all right pi upon six and this becomes pi upon six also okay now this is when we start finding out the values of 2x plus pi upon 3 okay so we'll start from 0 and this angle is pi upon 6 and pi upon 6 what I would like you guys to do is do a bit of sneak peek and see that pi upon 6 is 0 0.523 okay and if you look at the decimal value of minus 5 upon 3 pi so minus 5 upon 3 times pi so this is minus 5.2 three five something okay and if you look at the decimal value of seven upon three pi so that's seven point three three something now why is it important to have the decimal values also it's so that we can compare our answers and see whether it's inside the range also and this problem usually occurs when the range is in in terms of pi okay when it's not in terms of pi when it's in decimal or when it's in degrees it's pretty simple okay but when it's in terms of pi do a bit of sneak peek and see what the decimal values are so that you know whether your answer is inside the range or outside the range okay so pi by 6 is as i mentioned pi by 6 is 0 0.5235 so that means it's inside the range okay and then the next value will be worked out using this okay so this will be pi plus pi upon 6 so if i do pi plus pi upon 6 why pi plus pi upon 6 because up until here is going to be 180 and then 180 plus pi upon 6 so this i'm looking at 7 upon 6 pi and then if i do a bit of sneak peek 7 upon 6 pi is 3.66 so that means i am very well inside the range so 7 upon 6 pi okay great now since a range doesn't just end at 2 pi or 360 that means we can go of complete a, another cycle okay but before i do that it's important for us to realize that we can go in a clockwise direction also why because a range doesn't start from zero it starts from minus five over three pi so that means i would like to see what this value is and i would also like to see whether this value is inside the range or not okay and why do i want to see this because i'm allowed to go in a clockwise direction also because x as you can see is negative also now what is this angle going to be if i want to work out this angle now don't worry about the negative sign okay when you're working out an angle in a clockwise direction do not let the negative sign uh, bother you at all okay so we'll just work it out like a regular angle so this angle up until here is going to be pi and from pi we'll have to minus pi upon 6 so that means pi minus pi upon 6 is going to be 5 upon 6 but let's just do it anyway so yeah 5 upon 6 and it's going to be 5 upon 6 pi but since we have gone in a clockwise direction we'll put a minus sign over here and then again let's do a bit of sneak peek so pi upon 6 is going to be minus 5 upon 6 pi sorry not pi upon 6 minus 5 upon 6 pi is going to be minus 2.61 so again we're very well inside the range so that means this value can be considered okay so the next value that we're going to consider is after going a complete cycle so we're going to go another cycle and how do you go another cycle well you add 2 pi which is 360 degrees to the values that you worked out initially so what is 2 plus uh, so what I'm doing is I'm just doing 2 plus 1 upon 6 and then I'll just write a pi towards the end so 13 upon 6 pi and then again multiply this by pi so that we can do a sneak peek so this is 6.806 so again we're very well inside the range because our range started from minus 5.235 and went all the way to 7.233 7.33 sorry 
Okay, now what we're doing, going to do is we're going to write down the value of x for which we're going to take every single value, meaning minus 5.6 pi. And by the way, if you're wondering why did I just stop over here? Why didn't I do 2 pi to 7.6 pi? Well, you're very welcome to try this, but you'll notice that it's going to be outside the range, meaning it's going to be greater than 7.33. And if you're wondering why didn't I go all the way here and worked out this angle, right? Basically the one that I'm making now. So again, you're very welcome to try out, but then you'll notice that this is outside the range. Okay. Now, now we have to work out the value of X for which we're going to take all these values add pi upon three in them one by one and divide by two. So let's do that. Let's find out the value of X. So X is equals to minus five divided by six minus one upon three. So I'm not writing the pi. Uh, so I'll just write that towards the end. So I'm looking at minus seven upon six divided by two for X. So we're looking at minus seven upon 12 pi. And then we're gonna do the same for pi upon six. So that's one upon six, again, ignoring the pi, minus one upon three divided by two. So we're looking at minus one upon 12 pi. So far so good, seven divided by six, minus one upon three divided by two. So we're looking at five upon 12 pi. And then finally, 13 divided by six minus one upon three divided by two. So we're looking at 11 upon 12 pi, and that's it. That's the correct answer. Okay, so I hope you guys have understood this and these questions are a bit tricky, but you know, that's what makes them fun. Okay, then we have question number five, which says find the possible values of the constant C for which the line y equals to c is a tangent to the curve y is equals to five sine x upon three plus four. Okay, now, so this question is actually far, is is more, is not as scary as it, it sounds, okay? And I'll tell you why. So basically, a lot of things in this question are, not a lot of things, but a couple of things in this question are basically useless, okay? Now I'll tell you why. And I'll also tell you that there are two ways through which you can solve this question and get the right answer. So basically, you want the, it says find the possible values of the constant C for which the line Y equals to C is a tangent to the curve. Now, one thing to note over here is that Y is equals to C is going to be a horizontal line, okay? Now, is that is that something I'm assuming? No, I'm not, because Y equals to some constant has to be a horizontal line. It can only be a horizontal line, okay? and. If it's a horizontal line, what does that mean? That means that the gradient dy by dx is equal to zero. So I'm basically looking for the point at which the gradient of this curve is equal to zero because that is the point where you will have a tangent line y equals to c, which is going to be a horizontal line. Okay, so that means let's get to work. Let's find out the dy by dx. So differential of sine is cos. So five cos x upon three multiplied by the differential of the angle, one upon three, and differential of four is zero. So we're looking at five cos x upon, sorry, five, uh, five upon three cos x upon three equals to zero. Now, cos of x upon three is equals to zero. Okay, now for this, your calculator is not gonna help you because if you work out cos inverse of zero, so yes, it will give you a value, but for values like zero, one, and minus one, it's best to recall the graph, okay? So we basically wanna find out when is cos equals to zero. Yes, uh, it says x upon three, but that's something we'll worry about later. But we wanna find out that when is cos equal to zero. So if you recall the cos, the graph of cos, this is what it looks like. So one point is here and the other point is over here. Now this point right here is 90 or pi upon two. And this point right here is um, 270 or three over two pi. So that means x upon three right here is either equal to pi upon two or it's either equal to three upon two pi, which means X is equals to three upon two pi multiplying all the sides by three or X is equals to nine upon two pi. Now bear in mind what you've done so far is you've only worked out the value of X. Okay, so now you're gonna take this value, plug it back into the equation and find the possible Y values. Okay, so five sine in place of X, we're gonna have three divided by or three pi upon two. Okay, in, in the numerator upon three, plus four, so we have one value, which is nine, okay? This is when x is equals to three upon two pi. And when x is equals to nine upon two pi, so I'm just gonna use the same uh, equation, except just replace three by nine. And we have another value, which is y equals to minus one, and that is the correct answer. And these aren't just y values. In fact, I should mention that these are the values of c. So c is equals to nine, or c is equals to minus one. There you go. Okay, now the other method, which is far, more simpler 
is that you know that you want a point where when you make a tangent it becomes a horizontal line okay and you want a point on the graph of sine okay so how do you do that well for that you just simply make this graph and ignoring x upon 3 because x upon 3 if anything is just going to change the value of x it's not going to change the value of y okay so i'm just going to make 5 sine x plus 4. so what happens if you make 5 sine x well this is what happens you get a graph that looks like this okay i've made it dotted because it's not the final graph and then what happens when you add 5 to all the values well your graph shifts five units upwards so what was at zero now moves at five and what was at five moves at nine okay so this point moves here and this point again moves here and what was at minus five moves up to minus one and then again what was at zero moves up to four so there you go now at this point you have to think that at what point should i make a tangent so that i get a horizontal line now the answer to that is very simple one is nine because that is the point where you make a tangent you get a horizontal line and the other is minus one so there you go c is equals to nine or c is equals to minus one now i know what you guys may be thinking that uh, well if it, this is far easier than this and i completely agree with that but this is something that may or may not click okay if it does click that's great if it doesn't no need to feel inferior or anything i mean this this way is still pretty legitimate right so yeah both ways the important thing is we get the correct answer and yeah that's what that really matters so yeah moving on Okay, this is again a question from polynomials, one of my favorite topics, and also very easy, to be honest. It says the polynomial p of x is equal to 10x cubed plus ax squared minus 10x plus b, where a and b are integers, is divisible by 2x plus 1. When p of x is divided by x plus 1, the remainder is minus 24. Okay, so if you look at this question, this question has basically two unknowns, a and b, okay? Which means that if you want the value of a and b, you want two equations okay so two unknowns means two equations okay so what we're going to do now is we're going to see how we can make those two equations now one way to make one equation is by plugging in the value of x so we may find the value of x x is going to be equal to minus one upon two and since it is divisible so that means the remainder is going to be equal to zero so for one equation i'll plug in x is equals to minus one upon two in the equation all right so p is equals to minus one upon two and set it equal to zero okay so i should probably just erase this because i'm gonna the space is already quite limited so 10 minus 1 upon 2 the whole thing cubed plus a minus 1 upon 2 the whole thing squared minus 10 minus 1 upon 2 plus b equals to 0 okay so what happens now is now we're looking at 10 into minus 1 upon 8 in fact you know what i'm not going to risk it i'm just going to use my calculator over here so 10 minus 1 upon 2 the whole thing cubed so we're looking at minus 5 upon 4 plus a upon 4 plus 10 upon 2 is 5 plus b is equals to 0 let's write this equation nicely so we're looking at a upon 4 plus b is equals to minus 5 plus 5 upon 4 so we are at minus 15 upon 4 and if you want you can take out the lcm or multiply both sides by 4 so you'll have a plus 4b is equals to minus 15 which is the well we'll just find out later whether it's correct but yeah it's correct so far okay <clears throat> Then it says when it's divide, divided by x plus 1, the remainder is minus 24. So that means when you do p of minus 1, this ends up being equal to minus 24. So 10 minus 1 cubed plus a minus 1 squared minus 10 times minus 1 plus b is equals to minus 24. So this looks like a, far, a much more simpler equation. So we have minus 10 plus a plus 10 plus b is equals to 24 so minus 10 plus 10 just take care of each other and we have a plus b which is equal to minus 24 there you go okay so now we now that we have two equations let's just write them over here a plus 4b is equals to minus 15 and we're going to use elimination to solve this so i'm just going to subtract the two equations so a minus a gets cancelled out b minus 4b is minus 3b minus 24 minus minus 15 is equals to minus 9 the two negatives get cancelled out and b is equals to 9 upon 3 which means b is equals to 3 and when b is equals to 3 
you go back and you say a plus b is equals to minus 24 which means a plus 3 is equals to minus 24 which means a is equals to minus 27 and there you go that's your final answer of i mean that's your answer to a and b respectively okay so now we're doing part b so for part b let's just write down the equation with the values of a and b that we have found so px is equals to 10x cube plus ax square now a turned out to be minus 27 so that means minus 27x square minus 10x plus b okay now uh, we already had one factor and that was 2x plus 1 the question gave us that at the very beginning so i'm going to take this 10x cube minus 27x square minus 10x plus 3 and divide by the factor which is 2x plus 1 and i should probably just make some room here okay now so what do I need to multiply 2x with in order to turn it into 10x cube? The answer to that is 5x square. So now we get 10x cube plus 5x square. Okay. Now we subtract. So 10 and minus 10 get cancelled out. That is what was meant to happen. Minus 27 minus 5 becomes minus 32x square minus 10x plus 3. Now what do I need to multiply 2 with so that it becomes minus 32x square? 2x with, sorry. The answer to that is minus 16x. So now we have minus 32x square minus 16x. So again, we subtract. So this gets cancelled out. Minus 10 minus minus 16 is going to be minus 10 plus 16, which is going to be 6x. And we bring down the plus 3. So what do I need to multiply 2x with so that it becomes 6x? The answer to that is plus 3. And there we have 6x plus 3. And once we subtract the 2, it becomes 0. And this is what was meant to happen because we were dividing it by a factor. So now we have to factorize 5x squared minus 16x plus 3 even further. And if I do that, I'll have to use middle term breaking. So factors of 15 that give us minus 16. So 5x squared. The answer to that is minus 15 and minus 1, by the way. Minus 15x minus x plus 3. So we take 5 along with x common, so we have x minus 3, and then we take minus 1 common, so we have x minus 3 again. And now you have the two factors from this quadratic equation and one factor from before that the question gave us, which I'm going to write down in red, and that was 2x plus 1. And there you go, that's your final answer. That was part B. Now we're doing part C, which says write down the remainder when p of x is divided by x. So I'm just going to copy paste this thing. Uh, Okay, so dividing by x basically means that x is equal to 0. So that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to plug in 0 in place of x. So 10x cubed instantly becomes 0, minus 0, minus 0, plus 3. So p of 0 is equal to 3. So that means the remainder is, or the remainder is equal to 3. And there you go. That was question number 6. Now, since I'm doing these questions in far, uh, in, in great detail, so... I'm going to do this in part. So this is where uh, I will be. So this is this is basically the first part of this video. In the next part, I will solve the remaining questions. So we are, I think, at the halfway mark. Yeah. So the questions left are. So we have another. Yeah. So we have another five six questions to go. But yeah, these questions I'll cover in the next video, inshallah. So yeah, let me know what your thoughts are about this video, and I hope you guys are benefiting from this. And uh, don't forget to share this with your friends, and do subscribe if you haven't, so that you stay updated. And yeah, that's all for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.